Good morning, um, this is Jim O'Brien again, and um, today we're going to start a uh, four webinar series, one a week, um, for the next uh, four weeks on Wednesdays. Um, the follow-up on what Karen had presented last week and the previous week on um, in inputting and assigning the data in the QGIS GUI that we have. So today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with sediment transport. Now, you know, Flow2D is a, a model that has uh, that people use a lot on two primary um, uh, types of projects. One is um, urban detail because we can do you know storm drains and flow in in uh, gutters and and street flow and roof runoff and all those sorts of things that you can't do with other models. And then the other uh, major project uh, type or uh, issue is is uh, you know hyper concentrated sediment flows. So what I'm going to do today is we're going to go through the continuum of of sediment loading and flooding up through mud flows and then we're going to talk on the last webinar about two-phase flow. So I'd like to, to begin this presentation with uh, uh, just a question for you. If you look at this flood uh, that's in western Colorado, you can see that it's got a lot of color in it and it's carrying a fairly large sediment load. Most of that's fines and wash load but um, I wanted you to think about what you might consider the concentration to be by volume. And the reason why I, I'm asking this question is because I took this picture and, and I went down to the other bank on the other side of the river right there where um, the cursor shows. And I had a bottle with me, it was a plastic bottle, and I stepped off the bank and, and uh, did a grabbed the sample, took me a couple of times to fill it, about two thirds or so, but I took a gallon of the of the uh, primary uh, flow material, the fluid matrix, back to the laboratory with me. So I wanted you to, so I know what this concentration of this uh, fluid matrix is, and I wanted you to see if you could guess at roughly the range of it, because it's important, and you'll see that um, it's important for mitigation design, for bridge designs, and, and so forth. And the concentration of this was about 22%, and that didn't include the rumbling boulders and, and cobbles, which make up a smaller part of the volume, um, that were rumbling along the bed of the channel, and you could hear them. Uh, the other thing I wanted to note here is that the flow is about six feet deep. And I estimated the velocity of around 12 to 15 feet per second in, in the main part of the flow. So this is a case where on most alluvial channels, you really have trouble reaching a fruit number higher than one because it just entrains more sediment. But this one's already scoured down to a pretty um, coarse material and or more or less bedrock condition. And the fruit number in this case, because the flow's around six feet deep, is just about 0.95, maybe maybe close to one. It's probably getting over to one in certain areas, at least through the bridge. And then it, as it spreads out downstream, it goes below one. But I wanted to mention to you that, you know, in an alluvial uh, channel situation like this, it's pretty hard to get um, fruit numbers above one. Now, let me get my mouse going here. So this is the first of a four-part webinar series. And so today we're going to talk about conventional sediment transport, and that involves uh, suspended load and bed load. And then next week, we're going to move on to hyper-concentrated sediment flows, and then an increasing sediment um, uh, concentration fashion will we'll get in go through mud floods and mud flows and then we'll talk about on the third week estimating the mud flow sediment yield and finally uh, the new flow two-phase flow component for mud flows and tailing stand breaches and the reason I inputted the uh, two-phase flow methodology was so that you could model tailing stands with uh, 
a reservoir uh, storage of water on top of the tailing. So when it broke or breached, the tail, the water would flow out of the tailings, and and uh, you'd have essentially two different um, phases in the in the flow moving downstream. So we'll get to that. So what I wanted to do was talk about sediment transport first and, and how it relates to the other hyper-concentrated sediment flows and how it's modeled in flow 2D. So the, um, if you look at a, a plot of concentration by volume and concentration by weight here, um, you can see that the water flow or basic uh, fluid flow is, is it, it behaves like water up to about on the order of 20%. After that, um, the uh, particle particle contact and, and the viscosity of the fluid matrix inhibits the fall velocity and you, you start uh, carrying more sediment without it dropping out. It's an inhibited fall velocity and that makes it become a hyper-concentrated sediment flow. And so you're going to go through this continuum of basic water behavior, fluid behavior, flooding up to mud flood mud flow, and then landslide. And what I mean by landslide is basically, you know, block, sliding, tumbling motion. Um, and although people have made attempts to model with uh, landslides with flow 2D, I don't necessarily recommend it. Um, and then the combined fluid and, two fa and, and mud flow can occur if the fluid phase is riding on top of a mud flood or mud flow um, event. So what we're going to cover today is a, a, just a few slides on some sediment transport concepts, and then a discussion of how you model the with the sediment transport, conventional sediment transport with flow 2D, um, and and the basic data entry to do that, and then we'll show a few results and 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 how you should interpret them. So in terms of some basic um, sediment transport, I, I want you to recognize that sediment transport is, is a, basically a graduate class. There are, you know, you can, there are entire major textbooks on sediment transport. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a complicated um, uh, topic to, to study. And uh, and so people, you know, I'm giving you the opportunity to use it in a rather simplistic fashion, um, but I don't want it to, uh, um, I don't want you to think that you're going to be an expert just because you um, you use this. I mean, there there's entire, um, you know, measurement um, techniques and and how to understand and see. Um, what types of bed form motion you have and, and how that relates to sediment concentration and so forth. So we're going to talk about a few of these things. I hope that it encourages you to follow up and, and, uh, and take it upon yourself to become more in tune with, with sediment loading. So just most of you probably understand and know this, but if you start out with an increasing shear stress on the bed, you'll you'll eventually get the particles on the bed to start motion. And as they move, they, they're generally moving in contact with the bed, creeping or rolling. And this is known as bed load. And it's usually just a few grain diameters thick is the um, height of the the bed load in, in the flow. And then once the shear stress increases that the particles become entrained in the flow, you see as a plot of concentration versus depth here that the concentration for the bed load is entirely limited to the um, uh, area next to the, to the bed. But for the suspended load, um, it, the, the concentration goes close to zero um, near the surface, and it's highly concentrated near the near the bed or the moving bed here. And then, if the particles are moving in quantities that are not appreciably found in the bed, then this is just considered to be wash load, and people generally ignore that um, in terms of the analysis. 
combined, these three make up the total sediment load in which the concentration might look something like this. Now, the, the wash load, almost all, your co almost all of your equations, sediment transport equations, are based on total bed material load. And the bed material load is made up of the bed load and the suspended load and ignoring the wash load. And again, because the wash load in your project area will just more or less get swept downstream. So what you need to do is to identify the dominant processes in your project area to select an appropriate sediment transport equation for an application of sediment transport component in Flow2D. Now, let me just uh, go over this very quickly. Um, different sediment concentrations will occur for different types of bed forms. And generally, the, the bed forms are broken up into two regimes, a lower regime sediment transport and an upper regime sediment transport. The lower regime sediment transport is um, uh, a consideration where you you typically have it in a mild slope uh, condition and then as you increase the shear stress on the bed you'll eventually um, go to upper regime flow now initially you might have some ripples on the bed first you're going to have plain bed with no motion then you're going to have some ripples um, ensue and gradually you'll you'll overtop these with um, uh, uh, dunes that begin um, pushing the ripples aside and, and making larger structures. Dunes are more or less just small ripple or larger ripples. And then uh, as you increase the shear stress further, the dunes begin to wash out and the bed becomes plain again with high sediment transport load. So you can have plain bed with very little motion or plain bed in upper regime flow with high sediment transport rates. And then as you increase the shear stress or, or increase the slope more, you eventually um, get to the point where you start having these uh, form, bed forms again, which are called anti-dunes. And, and then the anti-dunes can get to a point where the, they're of such magnitude that the, there's a breaking wave. And the wave is stationary, more or less, in the um, river or channel based on the fact that the anti-dune is, is sitting there. But the anti-dunes don't necessarily just sit there. They tend to move upstream. The, the dunes in lower regime flow move downstream. The, the, the bed form of anti-dunes actually moves upstream. And that's because the particles deposit on the front face of the, of the, the dune itself because the, the particles are slowing down. And, and they get peeled off the downstream side. In, um, in, in normal uh, lower regime flow, the particles are peeled off the upstream side, deposited on the downstream side. So the bed is always moving, the bed form is always moving downstream. And what is unique about these two different types of dunes is that in lower regime flow, the, the um, waveform in the fluid is out of phase with the waveform on the bed. And that is, you'll see the higher um, uh, peaks of the, of the wave movement associated with the trough in, in lower regime dune, dune trans, sediment transport. And the, the, the trough will be associated with the, with the, uh, with the dune um, peak. Now, in anti-dunes, um, they're actually in phase. And so the troughs and the peaks uh, are uh, comparable in, in location. And then if you get even higher, then you start getting to this pool and shoots and pools. And this gets into upper regime flow that's approaching um, supercritical flow. And you get these breaking waves um, that rapidly dissipate as more sediment is uh, peeled off the bed. And so here's just some other pictures associated with uh, the uh, different uh, sediment bed forms. Now you can look up any textbook and see these. 
In Flow2D, what you want to do is to associate these with a bed form. Now, I mentioned this as these are flume Manning's end values. When you see these kind of bed forms in a um, uh, river system or in a channel, that's not the only resistance to flow. It's just the flow resistance that is local to that short reach of river. If you have expansion and contraction, acceleration, deceleration, there's going to be other contributions to the resistance to flow, and you should use a higher end value. But here's some um, uh, different uh, end value ranges associated with uh, um, sediment transport bed forms. And you can see as you go up through and increase the, the slope or the shear stress on the bed, and through, as you go through dunes, they have the highest end value associated with them. And then once again, as the dunes um, begin to plane out and the flow approaches upper regime, the bed form, the plane bed drops again. Or, I mean, the, the end value drops again, and, and the water surface will actually drop too. Even if you're increasing discharge, the water surface could drop associated with going from dunes to plain bed because the resistance to flow goes down. So you can consider that. Now, um, over my career, because i am um, been doing this since about 1982 or so, I've been collecting a lot of river data throughout the Western United States mostly. And um, I've uh, designed uh, sediment transport data collection methods for the Bureau of Reclamation on the Rio Grande and, and so forth. And we've used all the different samplers, the point samplers and the, um, the, the different uh, um, current meters and, and the bed load samplers. We've even designed a few of our own um, bed load samplers. But in general, um, people would use a D70, you know, now a lot of this is automated and it's done with um, various optics and so forth. And, and uh, I'm not that familiar with those uh, newer methodologies that you could use. I always use these older um, USGS D74 samplers to get a de depth integrated bed load sampler and you drop the sampler to the bed and it would go down close to the bed, but not directly on the bed. And the missing or unmeasured zone here below this um, uh, D74 sampler would be picked up by this bed load sampler. Now the bed load sampler was designed for cobbles and gravels so that they would roll along and pop into this. The problem is is that if you mismatch the opening with the flow of the river and you either um, accelerate the streamlines into this or you force more water out or, or have slower flow going into the into the mouth of the the sampler, you're going to either you know uh, have some sediment go around the sampler or some sediment get sucked off the bed or vacuumed into the into the sampler. So you have to take a lot of measurements with a bed load sampler like this in order to have meaningful results. But in general, what happens is, is that you get a suspended sediment concentration for sand bed, say coarse sand bed, that might look like this with respect to depth. And then if you add the turbulent velocity profile, in this case where you have higher velocity um, along the x-axis, and then you combine these two, then the actual sediment discharge will look like this in a channel where it's highest somewhere in the mid-range of the suspended load, it's a little bit less near the uh, top because the concentration's smaller, even though the velocity's higher, and and it's also higher in mid-range than than near the bed. So that just kind of gives you an idea of the distribution of the of the sediment in a typical sand bed channel. Now. What you also have to understand is that all the equations that I'm going to show you in Flow2D are based on sediment transport capacity, meaning that you have basically an unlimited supply, and so you're only going to, of sediment upstream, and so you're only going to be um, uh, capacity limited by the hydraulics of your system and your size of your sediment. So if you look at increasing sediment size from wash load to boulders up here, 
um, versus how the sediment discharge um, is increased with uh, um, in you know with a given for a given uh, water discharge, what you will see is that for the very fine sediment, if there's only a limited supply of of fines in the upstream watershed, you will be somewhere on the lower end of the of the sediment curve, which is the red red curve here. That's the, the actual sediment loading. The supply is almost unlimited. Um, I'm sorry, in this case, the supply is limited, but you have unlimited capacity to transport the sediment. Eventually, you'll reach a point where the hydraulics of the system will begin to reduce the amount of sediment that you can carry, even though there's sufficient supply to carry it. And so what happens is, is that this becomes a bit of a curve where you're initially supply limited and then your capacity limited. And um, this is important because if you've got a supply limited condition for the watershed that you're in for the sediment sizes that you're modeling, then your application of a sediment capacity equation will possibly overestimate the amount of sediment that is actually being used for a given model simulation. So here's a few things to think about when you're using the sediment transport um, component in fluid flow 2D. First of all, for really large flood events, like on the order of the 100 year event or really anything above bankful discharge, the effects of scour and deposition on the maximum water surface is negligible. And, and the reason is for that is that the scour hole itself that the, may develop is, is basically um, a, a negligible volume compared to the amount of water that's coming downstream. So it really has no effect on the water surface elevation. And that's why FEMA flood events don't, um, you know, FEMA uh, defer maps don't consider um, sediment deposition and scour for most um, channel flooding events. And that's because back in 1986, I believe it was the Water Research Resources, the Water Resources Research Council did a study with like, and, and examined six different models, including, um, um, you know, the different um, HECRAS, uh, HEC, HEC models, HEC6 models, um, um, yeah, uh, uh, oh, um, Simons Lee's uh, model, uh, Mod, Mod Heck, and um, oh, there were six of them all together. Boy, my memory is starting to fail me here. Um, anyway, um, they they examined six of these, and they found that not only was the the results of the application of these all over the place, but also they they recognized that it really had no effect in the modeling of the water surface elevation. And, and that's certainly true. Now, they, it might not be so true if you're doing uh, flow over an alluvial fan and everything is um, depositing and it's spreading out everywhere. And so the deposits themselves might force the flow to evolve. But in general, for channel flow and lo really large flood events, the effect of scour and deposition on the maximum water surface is negligible. So you should um, take that into consideration when you're applying the flow 2D model. And I'll talk a little bit about this again at the in the conclusions. For really small flood events, the two to five year event or slightly below bank full discharge and for alluvial fan flooding, avulsion and conveyance loss um, might become important. And if that's true, then um, you, you might want to do sediment routing. Now, here's a typical result in, in flow 2D where um, there was a, uh, this is the Rio Grande River for about, uh, I think, uh, well, um, 120,000 feet or about 40 miles or so. And it's downstream of a, uh, diversion dam, Santa Casha diversion dam. And so there's rigid bed just below the dam. And then just off the rigid bed for the first half mile or so, you get quite a bit of scour of the sediment size that's in, in the channel. And the scour extends for some distance downstream. Then 
some of that scour begins to deposit on the bed and then you get a little scour depending on the channel geometry and slope and and so forth and then you get scour and deposition scour and deposition the rest of the way so after <coughs> excuse me equilibrium is established in the system um, for, the, for a given sediment transport equilibrium, then you get this wave effect moving through. And so you, you would see scour and deposition occurring in different locations at different times, but the same magnitude of scour and deposition on the order of a foot or two is going to occur for typically bank full discharge in, in this fashion. It's like traffic movement, movement. Now in the flow 2D model, I'm doing this, I'm not modeling, this isn't Lagrangian um, particle dynamics. We're not tracking the particles of fluid and particles of sediment. I'm doing, uh, you know, this is a, a central differencing scheme of a finite difference uh, volume model, finite volume model. And so um, what I'm going to do with this model is I'm going to estimate the sediment transport using sediment transport equations. I'm not um, calculating the sediment velocity and, and, and having one solution, matrix solution of the river hydraulics and the sediment height and the sediment motion. Instead, what I'm doing is uncoupled sediment transport. And in, the, in that regard, Flow2D first calculates the flow hydraulics, then it computes the sediment transport. Now, using this kind of approach, I'm assuming that any changes in the channel geometry or the floodplain topography for a given computational time step are relatively small, so they're not going to affect the flow hydraulics for the next time step. And in the model, and I'll, I'll make an, another note of this in the next slide or two. Uh, another important aspect of this in the model is that the sediment scour and deposition is non-uniformly distributed on, on the bed of the channel cross section, and it's based on shear stress, but it's uniformly distributed on the floodplain elements, obviously, because we just have flow in and out of a cell in the um, on the surface of the of the unconfined flow. So the way this is occurring is, is that you have a certain, here's a given cell, and the cell either represents a portion of the riverbed or channel cross section um, for a, a discretized uh, river uh, cell or overland. Now, if it, let, let's just consider this as being overland and maybe not very deep flow, maybe on the order of a foot or two. But whatever it is, um, we have a given riverbed, and you can define how thick the bed is going to be. And then the model will um, compute sediment exchange with the cell in an exchange layer. And so you have sediment coming in from the upstream elements. So you have a sediment load or discharge, sediment discharge moving into the cell. And then you compute based on the hydraulics for the time step, a sediment transport capacity out for a given sediment transport equation. So the difference between the sediment capacity out and the supply in represents a change in storage. And that storage change can be deposition or um, scour. And, and that exchange occurs, uh, or that change in storage occurs with the exchange layer. If, and so we'll talk a little bit more about this exchange layer when I get to sediment size fractions. But I've done a lot of testing of, of this over the years, over the past 30 years or so. And generally, five or more time steps, that is on the order of a second to two seconds usually, or maybe a little more. Um, in the flow 2D model, the computational time steps. Generally, five or more time steps are required to change the riverbed elevation or, you know, uh, floodplain elevation by roughly a tenth of a foot or 0.03 meters. So, what this means is that for a given computational time step, you're only adjusting the bed on the order of hundredths of, of, of a foot. And so, that has no effect on the channel storage. So the assumption of it's a non-coupled solution is more than appropriate. Now, 
let me go through a few uh, concepts here with you just so that we're all on the same page. I talk a lot about concentration by volume, and I'm going to do this again next week uh, when we get into mud flows, sorry. Um, but the concentration by volume is nothing more than the volume of sediment divided by the total volume. That is the volume of the sediment plus the volume of the water. And in flow to d, the sediment volume is what's being tracked. So it, it tra tracks both the water and the sediment and every grid element during each time step. And so it knows that. So it has it has continuous running assessment of the concentration by volume in each grid element. Now, if, if it's necessary, you can convert um, concentration by weight into concentration by volume. And the reason I put this here is generally your measurements in the laboratory, when you bring the sediment sample back, dry it, burn off the organics and so forth, and then you weigh the um, <clears throat> uh, sample uh, size that you're going to test and, and maybe add water to it. And, and you do all this by weight you, you, in order to uh, simplify how much uh, computations you have to go through. So everything is done by weight. So what you have to do is if you're going to use it in the model, you have to convert it to concentration by volume. And that's just the equation where this is specific weight of water, specific weight of sediment. So this is buoyancy and this is the concentration by weight. And then there's another coefficient that that I use in the model that is generally not, people are not that familiar with, and that is the sediment gradation coefficient, which is nothing more than the large sizes over the small sizes. So it's the ratio of the, the D84, or roughly D90, over D50, and plus the D50 over D16 to the half size. So it gives you a, an estimate of how big the sediment is compared to what what is the range of sediment? So if this is this number is fairly small, say on the order of one or so, you have almost uniform uh, sediment sizes. If it's on the order of ten, you have a great diversity of sediment sizes in your bed condition. And finally, one more, and that's the bulking factor. Now. <clears throat> The bulking factor is nothing more than one over one minus the concentration by volume. But this is important because for peak discharges or for, for understanding the discharge and the volume in a flood event, if you're approaching a concentration by volume of say on the order of 50%, now remember that flood that I showed you in the first slide was on the order of 20%. If it's on the order of 50%, the bulking factor is on the order of two. So for that picture that I showed you with the bridge, and I'll show it to you again here in a second or a different picture, the concentration was on the order of 20%. So the bulking factor is going to be about 1.25. So if you've, you're designing a bridge for the 100-year event and you're anticipating a a typical load on the order of 10 to 20 percent and you want to be a little conservative maybe select a bulking factor associated with 20 percent concentration by volume well your flood event has suddenly gone from you know a thousand cfs to 1250 cfs and so this becomes a fairly big deal it means that back for the last 50 years or so, people have been designing flood events based on clear water, when in reality, they're under designing the event for by about 25% or possibly more. So again, I, I show you this because, you know, I, I estimated this um, discharge through this. I thought it was about uh, three to 5,000 CFS, depth of about six feet or so. Um, really ripping through here now um, in this constriction through the bridge, and it's probably approaching supercritical flow. Um, you can see that the riprap sizes are probably getting launched as the the because there's no um, filter material or so, something in here. But this concentration by volume was 20%. It was actually 22%. And so, you know, if this bridge can care if if the hundred year event is going to have something on approaching 
uh, 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 this kind of sediment load on the order of 20% concentration by volume, you're going to be under designing this flood event if you've done it for clear water flow for this bridge design. So hyper-concentrated flow behavior is a function of sediment concentration. This was part of my PhD dissertation where I went out and got a bunch of different mud flow samples, actual deposits. And I compared these with other, other people's publications at the time, which was mostly Chinese and, and, a, and a few others, but <clears throat> um, back in 1986, this was. And, and what we're talking about today is uh, water flooding. That is less than on the order of about 20% concentration by volume. So this is a water flood with conventional suspended load and bed load. And as you increase the concentration by volume and you want to reflect on it by concentration by weight, you can see that what I've done here is that by, from laboratory analysis I, of all these different types of deposits, some which had um, different types of clay deposits in them, as well as different concentrations of fines and so forth, um, you could have uh, a very fluid event up to on the order of 40 to 45% concentration by volume. And in that case, the flow mixes easily, shows fluid properties and de deformation, spreads on a horizontal surface, but couldn't maintain a, a, a slightly inclined surface. Once you're into 45 to 55%, it becomes a mud flow. And at 50 to 55%, flow is evident. You have a bulking factor of about two. And so you're doubling the discharge, doubling the volume. You can have a slow, uh, sustained mud flow creeping down the hillside, plastic deformation under its own weight. It's cohesive and it will not spread on a, on a level surface. Once you're above 55, 56%, 56 percent concentration by volume is the maximum packing factor for spheres. You can pack more sediment in and amongst the spheres and get a higher concentration, but in order for the flow to occur, you've got to separate the particles. So the highest you're going to get in terms of an actual fluid event is somewhere on the order of 55 to 60 percent concentration by volume. And above that, you're walking on it because, you know, normal um, porosity conditions for ground is on the order of 35 to 45 um, percent. So um, this is landslide stuff. So going back now, having said that, and we'll go over that again next week with mud debris flows, but I give you the choice of 11 sediment transport equations. These are all equations that I've used for various projects in the past, and so I've added them to the model. Um, and each formula in this was based on some different type of conditions, either flume or river conditions. And so you need to research your equation and see which one might be appropriate. I'm going to try to help you a little bit here over the next few slides to do that. Um, um, by the way, uh, the zeller fullerton equation is fairly ubiquitous, and that's why I listed it number one. Um, it was done over a wide range of slope conditions and so forth, and because the F in flow is Bill Fullerton, the flow stands for, flow 2D stands for Fullerton, Lanzati, and O'Brien. It doesn't stand for um, flow FLO without the W. Um, it stands for uh, the first firm that I joined with my two friends, uh, Bill Fullerton and Jim Lanzati. And Bill was the one who derived the equation with Mark, Mike Zeller, who's down in Tucson. So I have... Um, uh, I have various descriptions of these, and if you go to um, the other, you, you, you can have a copy of this PowerPoint presentation and a copy of the recording. Um, however, um, these are also in the, in the manual and uh, different white papers and, and so forth. But a brief description of each of these equations is uh, presented at the end of this presentation. So if you download this um, recording and the PowerPoint presentation with it after it's posted, um, you'll have a, a description of each of these equations. And so they tell you a little bit about it. This is a computer generation of the Meyer-Peter-Mueller 
bed load equation combined with Einstein suspended load. So you're taking the Meyer-Peter bed load equation and um, extending it up into the flow with Einstein sediment load. And Einstein sediment load then is based on the on the my on the bed load um, and projected into the flow. And it and so to generate a total bed material load, um, Bill did this. Um, and it assumes that basically all the sediment of sizes are available for transport. There's no armoring, um, although you can use it for armoring. Um, the original Einstein method is assumed to work best when the bed load constitutes a significant portion of the total load. So this has been found by Pierre Julian at CSU to work quite well and in terms of Einstein's original um, uh, suspended load methodology. And so uh, it's, it's, it's fairly good for steeper slopes and so forth. So um, I'm going to go through this a little bit with you here. Uh, so I choose some different transport equations for different um, systems. Now, again, remember, these are sediment transport capacity equations so that um, the limitation here is not going to be supply, it's going to be the ability to carry the sediment. So the, here's the eight equations, Zeller, Fullerton, Yang, and so forth. Now, Engeland and Hansen and Akers and White generally um, generate fairly high sediment loads and may be more appropriate for um, alluvial fans than all the other equations. Um, I was gonna show you how to evaluate this in, in a few minutes. Uh, Larson and Toffoletti don't generate very high sediment loads, but were based on sand bed systems. Kareem Kennedy and Van Rijn are more moderate equations. For cobble bed and gravel cobble bed systems, I give you five others, including Parker, Klingman, Klingman and McLean's. Um, for steep alluvial fan conditions, I suggest Zeller Fullerton, Yang's, Meyer Peter Mueller, Smart, Meyer Peter Mueller Wu, um, maybe Parker, Klingman, and McLean, um, Angelin and Hansen and Akers and White. If you really want to sock your system full of sediment uh, moving downstream from the alluvial fan apex, you can use these two equations. So, sediment equations, uh, sediment transport capacity equations that are a function of slope, um, either the bed slope or energy slope, um, include this grouping of the equations. So it, um, these are sensitive to slope. If your slope is uh, has a lot of variability and so forth, you may have some instability with some of these equations. Um, sediment transport equations that are a function of shear stress or, or incipient motion are these um, equations. Some of these are overlapping, obviously. Um, and uh, you can select from them. So which of these are the best equations? Well, if you apply these to different measurements and different systems, um, you can see what happens. You get a, a full range of, of sediment transport capacity relationships. Some of these equations are, are outside ones that I've selected for use. I've selected Larson, Yang, Kareem Kennedy, Engeland and Hans, and Akers and White. And um, there's others. Um, Meyer Peter Mueller, I didn't use directly, but I used a, some combined Meyer Peter Mueller and Smart, um, especially for um, breach of dams and so forth. But these are sediment transport equations, the ones that do the best are listed in here. This is from Julian's book. Um, from Yang's book, he ranked his. Um, uh, some of the equations that he selected. Um, I, and for these, I've also put into the flow 2D model. And not surprisingly, Yang ranked his own equation as the best one here. For those of you who know, you know, know Ted Yang, um, this would not be out of character for him. So um, he, he has uh, selected all these different equations. But you know, the bottom line is, is that you have to look at the conditions of your project and then make some selection based on that, those conditions. And even Yang's equation can give fairly unreasonable results based on project, various project conditions. So in control.data, 
um, in order to make a sediment transport simulation with um, uh, sediment data um, in Flow2D, what you have to do is go to the control.data file and set the ISED switch to on, set the mud flow to off, and set the bulking factor or the concentration bulking factor here to zero. This is just used to bulk water discharge without doing a sediment transport. So if you wanted to see how much more discharge you had based on a concentration of 20% concentration by volume, you could set this to point to and run this and you wouldn't need any of the other two switches turned on. So you just turn on the sediment, turn off the mud, make sure it's set to zero. For two-phase flow, we're going to set mud equal to two. For mud flow, you set it equal to one. Um, in channel.data on line one for each channel segment, um, you, you would uh, put at the end of the line uh, I equals one, and this is a, a grouping or, or a, a, a sediment group or an equation in which you can define different equations for different segments in your channel. So if you divided your channel up into different segments, you might have a tributary, you might have a main channel, you might have the main channel go from alluvial to concrete lined and so forth, and you select different um, channels. Now, the way that we, you will probably be doing this from now and forever in the future, um, is with the G, QGIS, um, uh, dialog windows, uh, dialog boxes here. Now we have both the GUI, the GUI, um, the old uh, GDS GUI uh, looks somewhat similar to this, but the QGIS, um, which Karen um, ha that demonstrated last week and so forth, um, this is the uh, form that you're going to see. And so the where you, what you're going to do to undertake a sediment um, transport analysis in Flow2D is by starting here, you're going to turn on the sediment transport. That next, what you're going to do is in this global uh, data assignment here is select the sediment transport equation. So you have access to all 11 here. You can assign a specific gravity, 2.65 is typical for sand. A dry specific weight, if you're doing this in metric, you have to enter metric for the dry specific weight. Um, sediment size is in millimeters for both English and metric units, and the size gradation is um, non-dimensional. So, you know, you choose something. Um, if it's a sand bed channel, then the size gradation is um, probably going to be on the order of two to three, maybe. Um, then you can select a sediment transport node, one single node, um, that will give you the results from all the sediment transport equations. And normally I would do this just downstream of the fan apex or somewhere in the middle of your system or near your project area. And I'll show you what the result of this looks like. So you just choose a given node for this condition. And I, this is important and I'll tell you why in a minute here. And then you can, if you want to limit the scour depth, if you have one equation that's going to really go nutso and, and generate a lot of scour and deposition, you may want to limit the maximum scour to something reasonable, like on the order of three feet or five feet, um, so that uh, you don't get a couple of scour holes that start getting on the order of 10 or 12 feet or something like that. And if this is in metric, you would put in one meter or something. So the next thing you do after you check, after you select the equation is to select the rest of these, and including the size. Um, the, this is a uh, fines, and so you don't want to select that. The D50 size range will be probably on the order of, you know, one to two millimeters, or if it's sand or or higher. Um, and then this one reporting element. Now, if you select the one reporting element, and in this case, it's the grid element number 7362, what it does is calculate the sediment transport capacity in either CFS or cubic meters per second for this particular grid element over the duration of your simulation. So you can look at this and see which equations for this typical grid element in the middle of your uh, project area uh, 
is is how they're generating and how they um, compare with respect to the other grid elements. So for this particular analysis, this might have been on a alluvial fan or something here, or on a dam breach uh, analysis or or whatever, um, the downstream of the dam. You can see that England and Hansen is fairly high in this case. Uh, Meyer Peter Mueller Wu is fairly high. Meyer Peter Mueller Smart is high. Um, Parker is 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 a little bit on the high side. Um, Yangs and Zeller Fullertons are more moderate. Um, they're in the ballpark of uh, Van Ryn. And then in this case, Kareem Kennedy, um, Toffoletti, Larson are on the on the more limited. Um, sediment transport uh, capacity uh, scale. But it, it's it not consistent. I mean, some of these, will, depending on the size fraction and your slope and your geometry and so forth, uh, your physical conditions, these will vary somewhat. Now, I'm not going to go through and describe every single one of these. That's up to you. And you have to do a little bit of research to see which one is applicable. But what I recommend is to go back and select those that I had for sand bed channels and maybe do three to five and see how the results vary, both not only for this particular file, but just the general conditions of your project. So in this case, what I have is I have a tailing dam that released um, fluid, and this was almost uh, like a two-phase flow condition here. But the tailing dam is like roughly right here, and so the release comes out and goes downstream. So what I'm plotting here are bed final bed elevation changes. That is the scour and deposition, where the deposition is in red and the scour is in blue. So here's the one for Larson, and you can see what it looks like. And you can also see that the red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, and so forth, you get the scour and deposition type of wave phenomenon. Here's Kareem Kennedy. Um, again, more moderate on the order of, I think this is in metric, so it's on the order of a meter or so. Toffoletti, um, somewhat low, but um, obviously higher than the previous two. Zeller Fullerton was somewhat moderate. Um, you can see that there's a lot more activity in the bed. Acres and White, um, in this case, moderate. Um, typically, Acres and White's a little on the higher side. Meyer Peter Mueller Wu, which takes into account um, uh, impacts uh, on sand size sediment due to fine concentration um, made up from areas of, of washes around Albuquerque and, and semi-arid de desert areas in the west. Um, you can see that it's it's moderate. Um, Van Rijn is moderate. Again, you see this scour deposition type of wave phenomenon. And, and again, this is the final scour and deposition. And we're getting higher orders of of scour depth here. Yang's is moderate in this case. I've listed it as moderate. Meyer Peter Mueller, a um, little bit on the higher end of being moderate, quite a bit of scour, a um, few scour holes on the order of a couple meters, um, perhaps. And Parker Klingman, um, high. Um, a lot of scour and deposition, even scour and deposition inside the movement of the um, of the uh, tailings dam as it began to drain. Likewise, England and Hansen very high, and so forth. So you get the idea, and this is how I would review the, your results and what they meant to you. Now, if your project was down here somewhere, or you wanted to see how far the effects were of scour and deposition were occurring from a dam breach event up here of some kind, then you know this would give you that order of magnitude. So you might choose some that are somewhat conservative if you wanted to see um, the potential impacts on a community which may be located here or something. Um, and you would see, you know, two to five meters or something like that. So how I would 
recommend that you interpret these results would be um, that you look for trends. And again, sediment moves in waves. I like to make the analogy like traffic. You know, if you get a traffic jam, it it uh, piles up and just like the sediment does when it can't get through a constriction in the channel. And then it, you know, um, accelerates through the constriction and, and begins to move again and, and sends the wave downstream. Um, scour and deposition will affect the slope hydraulics for the next time step, but only to a negligible degree, not so much that it, it's going to impact your application of the sediment deposition, but over time, it has a moderating effect because what happens is where it's steep, it deposits sediment downstream of the steep slope, backs water up through it, and, and begins the depositional process again until the slope is steep again, and, and then it starts to scour again. So um, you want to analyze these aggradational, de degradational type of effects. Now, it's not an actual aggradation, degradation model over geologic time, but I said that in order to distinguish from local scour and deposition. Flow2D is not an accurate predictor of local scour and deposition on, uh, around bridge piers or any other local facilities. I would, uh, you know, while you might do this along a wall or something like this, in the end, I would take your local hydraulics and, and apply it and maybe take the flow to d hydraulics, maximum hydraulics, and apply it to see what the potential is for exaggerated local scour in an area. But um, I'm not doing two-dimensional flow around bridge piers or three-dimensional flow for that matter. So you're just looking at general scour and deposition in a channel or on a floodplain. So look for relative magnitudes with statements like, we're expecting up to or on the order of one meter of scour in this reach over, say, half a mile or something like that. And identify where more detailed analysis or methodologies are necessary to uh, do outside of the flow to d model. Now, even though I say that you can't do the kind of local scour for detail in the model, we can do sediment routing size by size fractions. And uh, this is the um, location that you're going to enter the size fractions. You can do this in groups of sediment, and you can assign those groups by selecting or importing a shapefile for different shapefile groups. And uh, it'll bring up this feature. Karen went over this with you a little bit last week. And at the end of the four um, webinars that I'm going to be doing, you could look at this again, or maybe I'll have it have her do it again so you can um, refresh your memories on how to enter this data. But first, you enter the global data and then enter the size fraction data for each soil group. And typically, you can have up to 100 groups, but typically there's only two or three, like on a alluvial fan or floodplain. This is what it used to look like in, in the GDS, just to give you, uh, for those of you who still use the GDS, here's some size fraction data and, and how the groups are set up, but it's the same in, in both forms. Now, when you do size fraction analysis, that means that you've got some sieve size that you've analyzed in the laboratory. Um, armoring is initiated. So potential arm armoring is automatically um, triggered if sediment routing is by size fraction is simulated. There are no switches here to turn on. The armoring process occurs when the upper bed layers become coarser than the fine than the sediment that's in the layers below. And, and as the fine sediment gets winnowed out of the bed, an armor layer occurs. And when the coarse sediment covers the bed so that the fines can't get out, you assume that it's um, armored. So I use Yang's suggestion in this case uh, and do an exchange layer of three times the D90. So this is automatically set up for you by the um, selection of the size fraction data that you've entered. Um, that you've assigned, and then you can prescribe the actual bed condition to bedrock, say 10 feet or something like this. So what happens is you start winnowing out these um, particles out of the bed, 
when the exchange layer becomes one third of the bed of its original size, it then replenishes the bed with the um, original size distribution of the um, channel bed material located in your supply source of your total riverbed condition. And so the, in this regard, then the, the exchange layer with the coarser sizes mixed with the other um, exchange layer becomes a little coarser until eventually all you've got left in the exchange layer are the um, coarse sediment sizes. So the model will track the sediment size distribution and the volumes of each sediment size in an exchange layer in each cell. Again, I mentioned to you that it's three times the grain size of the bed material, D90 bed material. Um, when the exchange layer is reduced to one third of the original volume, it's replenished from the initial bed material source. So this is how you can actually armor the system and there's nothing for you to do if you uh, assign sediment size routing by um, size fraction. So um, if, if you see that your results are becoming a little unstable, and most models have an issue with, with some, some equations that are not necessarily applicable to slope, geometry, and sediment size in, in your system. The, the capacity equations are not really applicable for that condition. And you might get some really large amounts of scour. scour. Assume some reasonable amount of scour. And, and although the model tends to be self-correcting for most of the scour cases, a typical maximum scour depth might be five to 10 feet or two to um, three or four meters. And if you assign that, then you'll see that um, you can, uh, by assigning this here, you'll see that you'll limit the scour for maybe a half dozen grid elements, and it's not going to affect the, the sediment and water distribution very much on your system. Now, if you got a couple of grid elements that just go crazy because you're doing it on the near an apex of an alluvial fan, well, then the rigid bed elements, um, you can assign one or two or more rigid bed elements so that you don't get any scour at all there. So if you have excess scour, um, you might want to look at whether or not it, the equation is it, itself is an issue. And those equations that have slope and velocity to higher orders of power are, are some of the culprits here. So um, Kareem Kennedy is that way. Um, uh, Meyer Peter Mueller Smart has an extreme slope um, parameter uh, exponent. Um, Angelin and Hansen velocity and slope. Um, and, and Zeller Fullerton also has this issue, but um, it's also uh, depth uh, to a negative exponent. So it offsets it a little bit, but it, it's to the fourth power. Um, and typically for bank full discharge, sediment transport is on the order of the third, second or third power to the fifth power, something on that order. So the ones that have higher um, orders on the exponent are the ones that are going to be the culprits for generating a lot of excess scour. When you have scour hole problems, um, you can increase n values. Make sure that you're at or near or less than um, supercritical flow in the super dot out file. Make sure that your reported supercritical flows are reasonable. If you have supercritical flow in an alluvial system that's on the order of two to three or something like that, then your end values aren't high enough. You might want to adjust the topography a little bit or smooth out the channel bed slope some um, to get rid of any scour hole problems. This can occur a little once in a while near the outflow nodes, for example because um, you're trying to maintain normal depth in the outflow node and, and the, and the uh, upstream elements are scouring a little bit. Um, review the upstream conditions um, for excessive supply, sediment supply, which is generating too much scour or deposition maybe in a location and the slope gets too steep. And, uh, and so you might want to uh, reduce the, the upstream supply somewhat to reduce the, the slope. Um, you can 
uh, assign the limiting depth, you can change the equation or assign a rigid bed. Now, in the channel, you have non-uniform scour and deposition distribution. Um, this may not impact the water surface elevation at all, as I mentioned to you for high channels. In, in the case, in this case on the Rio Grande, the flow was about 1500 CFS here. Um, we actually uh, surveyed this, this cross section at or near this discharge. Um, I ran the model on it. Um, the maximum change in the bed was just about an hour a foot or two of scour. This is two feet. As you can see, it's a non-uniform distribution in that the, it scours deeper in, in the deepest part of the channels where, this, where the depth is deeper. Um, but you can also see that at 1500 CFS, so this is a plot of the water surface, at this discharge or at this time, you can see that the, the slope of the water surface varies hardly at all um, for this condition. And this is probably a constriction in the channel so that the bed or the water surface elevation drops a little bit as it accelerates the flow through this constriction. And then we have a um, scour hole developed, but you can see that the scour hole had, and this is up to like a foot or two, um, but it had no effect on the water surface elevation at all. And this is even for a flow less than bank full discharge. So um, that was to highlight what I had said before to you. However, if you're getting um, a lot of scour and it's causing too much instability, you can assign rigid bed elements in your channel. And if you need to do that, then your channel mitigation is gonna look like this anyway. Um, let's talk a little bit about sediment supply. If you have a river channel and there's been lo loads of sediment data collected over the years, as on the Rio Grande, then you can assign a sediment supply that's a function of discharge. Um, however, the odds of you having this are almost nil to uh, those bordering on uh, um, winning the lottery. So, uh, you know, what you have to do instead is, well, you can assign the sediment supply rating curve here and assign it for a given, and assign the sediment supply by size fraction if you'd like. However, typically for upstream sediment, and this applies to both channel and um, overland flow like alluvial fans, assign an inflow node. The sediment transport capacity is computed for the inflow node, and this constitutes a supply to the downstream node condition. So I might extend my model up several grid elements above a fan apex. First of all, I might have done a watershed analysis and gotten a, a flood hydrograph um, with flow 2D at this location. Then I input this um, inflow hydrograph as an inflow node here. Um, I don't assign a sediment supply to it. I just let it run because it is an inflow node. It has a rigid bed automated assigned to it regardless of the fact that it's computing the sediment transport capacity out of that node. So it calculates the sediment transport capacity out of that node. It's likely that it's gonna deposit some, maybe then scour a little bit as this steepens a little bit. But by the fan apex, if you've done this three to five grid elements upstream, you should be in sediment transport equilibrium for that sediment transport equation and these conditions in your channel or in your alluvial uh, 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 fan canyon or whatever. Um, and then the rest of this is actual scour and deposition that you can expect based on the way that you're modeling it. So there's nothing for you to do. In other words, I generate the sediment supply for you from the sediment transport capacity equation. I've tried to make this as simple as possible for, for you to, to do this, but you know this do, doesn't um, detract from your ability to understand the system. You need to do some background research on this, on sediment transport and the equations that you're using. Now in the summary.out file, um, first thing you wanna look at is that you conserve water um, in the simulation run and that then you can see that I have 
100% for 24 hours in this particular run. Um, this was a tailings dam breach, so I had uh, tailings water content, bulk sediment for a total volume and so forth. And then you can come down here and look at sediment volume conservation. And this might be on the order of, uh, uh, you know, a few cubic meters to a few hundred meters. In this case, it's absolute volume conservation for both water and sediment. Um, but that just means that for whatever the sediment supply is from the inflow node or from the tailing dam breach analysis that you've done and input a sediment supply or whatever it is, um, it's conserving volume on an, on an element to the, to the millionths of 1%. So. So in summary then, sediment transport is a very complex issue. And it may not be necessary if you're doing a huge flood event. So you need to consider this. Um, if you're gonna do a sediment analysis, I would increase the project schedule and budget. Um, I would extend the schedule um, by a month or more from your original project and, and you're gonna need uh, more money to do it. Um, maybe up to, if, if your entire project revolves around sediment transport and where sediment's gonna deposit in your mall parking lot or something like that, then um, you know, you're going to need two to three months extra budget or something on that order. Cause you're gonna be doing a lot of runs and you wanna test a lot of different sediment transport equations and so forth. Uh, in the end, you wanna assess and, and, and get some general trends out of this and look for areas of scour and deposition. But I wanna uh, caution you again that this is not an accurate prediction of bridge, pier scour, or any other local scour prediction where you need a 3D type of analysis. And once again, remind you, for infrequent flooding on the order bank full discharge or the 100 year event, um, the scour really has no impact on the water surface elevation. So you need to assess the need for doing a sediment transport analysis. So this is the end of part one, the, the sediment transport. And in the rest of this PowerPoint presentation, I give you a brief description of each equation that I promised you. Here's Zeller-Fullerton, the fruit number range, velocity, bed slope, Yang's equation, um, Angelin and Hansen and so forth. So I give you a brief description of these here at the end of those. I'm not going to go through each one. It would take me days to actually discuss this. So next week, we're going to talk about um, mud flows in the, in the first, um, uh, the second PowerPoint, uh, second webinar will be on mud flow um, description and how to use it. And then the third, webinar will be on, on estimating sediment yield for mud flow conditions. And then the fourth one will be on two-phase flow for tailing stand breach failures and, and just general conditions where you have a mud flow going down and it enters uh, or a tributary enters uh, the mud flow river channel perhaps and uh, dilutes it. So we're going to have an opportunity. And now the two-phase flow model runs for both channel and overland flow. And we'll be, by the time uh, the fourth week is here, it'll be available um, to you. So let me uh, go ahead and um, pause this, um, stop the recording. <laughs>